All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second in installment of this fall's Finding the Source program. Um, I'm Ashley Lusky. I'm the Assistant Director of the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College, uh, joined by Pete Carmichael, Director of the Civil War Institute. And today we have with us Professor Michael Gora, who is the uh, Mary Augusta Jordan Professor of English at Smith College in Massachusetts, where he has taught for 35 years, is that correct? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Gora is uh, the author of numerous uh, published articles, books, book reviews, um, including a 2012 book entitled um, Portrait of a Novel, Henry James and the Making of an American Masterpiece. It was actually a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize uh, in biography. Uh, he's also noted as an accomplished public scholar, having received numerous awards for his work there, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And he has served as a judge for the National Book Award in Fiction. So he has quite a, a distinguished career, and we're happy to have someone from uh, outside our narrow profession of the historical world uh, to join us in kind of a multidisciplinary uh, approach to uh, to history and literature today. Um, and actually, we should actually we should add we add one more achievement uh, to Michael's uh, very impressive resume. Uh, this June, Michael will be coming to the Civil War Institute uh, to give a talk, a more formal talk, uh, about his work on Faulkner. So uh, I don't know where that's going to fit, Michael. With I'm so looking forward to being able to give a lecture in person again. Yeah, good. Yeah, I well, we look forward to having you. So yeah, yes. Michael, thank you so much for being here. And so um, what we'll be talking about today is of course, Michael Gora's uh, newest book on William Faulkner entitled The Saddest Words, William Faulkner's Civil War. Um, and before we get started with that, we just wanna add that we do have the ability to receive comments and questions um, in our toolbar on Facebook Live. So please, we encourage you at home to get involved in the discussion, um, ask some questions, add some comments and, uh, we'll try and keep track of them as we go along and, and address them as we can. Um, so just to get us started, Michael, I'm, I'm curious, both both Pete and I are William Faulkner aficionados and, and fans. Um, and so combining a discussion of Faulkner with uh, a discussion of the Civil War, you're combining two of our, our favorite things, of course. And in reading your work, you're obviously an accomplished scholar of uh, literature and the English word. But I could also couldn't help but notice that there might be a hidden historian uh, inside you who is uh, kind of gnawing, trying to get out. Um, so I'm kind of curious from a, from a personal perspective, what was it that led you to William Faulkner uh, to write about him in the way that you have with this book, this combined literary and historical uh, approach? Yeah, thanks. Um you know, the, the, I, I, I almost majored in history in college uh, uh, or almost in American studies as well. And I kept on flip flopping back and forth and decided, no, 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 I'll just stick to the one. But I've always read a lot of history. But so, so the, the way this book started was, um, and it's a little embarrassing to put it this way, but I, I was in Paris and, you know, it makes it sound terribly comfortable, but, but it, and it, it wasn't bad, but I was in Paris. And, um, um, I had done a little bit of work on Faulkner. I'd edited the Norton and thought, Norton critical edition of His I Lay Dying. I'd always taught a little bit of Faulkner, mostly in classes for first years. This is the fall of 2010. And the, the, during that fall, that fall is the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's election of the first seceded state, South Carolina. And the New York Times started running a series called Disunion. On its editorial page, on the the edit on the electronic editorial page, and I started reading those, and I, and I thought, well, these 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 are interesting, and it's bringing me back to what what little American history I knew, um, and I thought, well, I'll read some more of these. I'll read some more of these, and then I was also, you know, I picked up a Faulkner book at the library. I hadn't brought any Faulkner with me to Paris. I'm still writing about about Henry James at the time, uh, and read some Faulkner, and I thought. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite see that they went together yet. But then I started uh, uh, early in the next year. Um, the Library of America published it, the first of its volumes, is superb, wonderful volumes on the Civil War as told by those who lived it. Um, 
selections of individual sources um, that um, you compiled maybe 800, 800 pages of documents for each year, letters and reports from the battlefield and newspaper articles and editorials and diary entries, all kinds of things. And I got one out of the library there, the American Library in Paris, and read that, read the first volume of that. And then I started hearing all kinds of echoes between that moment and our moment. So remember 2010, this is when when uh, the Tea Party, that was the Tea Party election. The Tea Party had won, um, basically won the House for the Republican Party. Um, and I started hearing in, in the, the talk that was coming out of the Tea Party about, about states' rights, about the echoes of nullification um, in some of the rhetoric. I started thinking, this sounds sort of like 1860. Some of the terms have been flip-flopped and so on. And then I read in, you know, I, get, I found what I hadn't known is that at some point Vermont had thought of seceding to get away from the fugitive slave law. Right. Um, so the, the fist of Paris nature of, of 1860 sort of fit with what seemed to be and has since become an even more fist of Paris quality in, in, in our politics now. And I, so I heard an echo and I thought, I thought, honestly, I thought, I'm gonna need another book to write sometime soon. Uh, and this will stretch me. I thought, and I thought at first, let's rewrite patriotic war. And patriotic war for the, I assume some people in your audience will know, it's an 800 page book that Edmund Wilson wrote in the 50s and early 60s about the literature of the Civil War. I think he started his New Yorker profiles. He went through all the diaries. He, you know, so there's a chapter on Mary Chestnut. He rehabilitated Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, he wrote a long, a long chapter on Grant's memoirs and Sherman's memoirs, and then on Alexander Stevens. He studied the literature of the Civil War, the, the writing that came out of the Civil War. And in part, one of the things he was doing was trying to answer the question, there, there aren't any great novels about the Civil War, he said, not from that generation. Right. You know, the Red Badge of Courage is a great novel, but, but it's not from this generation. So what did they do instead? Well, they, they left documents, letters, diaries, speeches, and he gave us a way, usually a lot of biographical criticism, to read those things. In some ways, in some ways, this was also answering Whitman's question, Whitman's claim that the real war will never get into the books. And you think, well, no, not if you think of the books as poetry and fiction. But if you think of letters and diaries, like Whitman's own specimen days, the real war is getting in there. Anyway, I thought, I'll rewrite Patriotic War. That's a nice small project. <laughs> and then I thought better of it. I thought, you know, that, that this is where angels fear to trim. Uh, and and then I thought, well, gee, I've, I've always loved reading Faulkner. I've always thought that he had, that the Civil War was all around the margins of his work, rarely an explicit subject around the margins. Well, why? What can that say? Can we read the war in Faulkner? What can he tell us about the war? What can the war tell us about him? Um, and so, so I, I, you know, you could say I fell back on Faulkner, but in some ways, I found I found what was for me the perfect subject in in putting Faulkner up against the war. And and what I then tried to do, one of the one of the one of the major problems or issues for people reading Faulkner is where to start. Um, he doesn't start at the beginning. He the novels all feed into one another. Um, I thought if, if I unkinked the narrative, if I rearranged his books in something like the events in his world, in his fictional world, in something like chronological order, I could tell a story about the South and its history that would take us from the generation before the war on up to Reconstruction and after. Um, and that, that, that the, the, the history that he has there is it's, it's all there, but it's, it's sliced and diced and, and you know, mixed different parts in different books. So I, I unkinked his narrative. I made it simpler. Um, but in doing that, I found there, there really was a connected history of, of the South in, in, in his work. But you, know, you say something, you just said that um, the Civil War and Faulkner's work is often on the margins. And now your point is, is that you have been able to extract right those those moments right. um, within his work to deal with the war, could you just give us a, a, a an assessment of what exactly 
does Faulkner help us understand about the war okay. that maybe we can't find somewhere else? Right, right. Okay. Um, so I'll go right at the big question. You're giving right. an easy one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so one, one of the things, one, one of the, among the many things he gives us is, is a sense in, in The Unvanquished, which is the one book that really is focused on the war, of the war at a distance. The war at a distance happening off in the margins of these people's lives. They're young boys, the novel focuses on, and then the war slowly coming more cl closer and closer to their to, to their homes in northern Mississippi. Um, at first, it, it's a, the war is a rumor; it's elsewhere, and then it starts to come home. Another thing that 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 he does is he captures, um, and you can find this in letters, of course, in newspaper reports. He captures what was for secessionists a moment of exhilaration uh, at the start of the war, when they think we're going to do this and it's going to be a big thing and it's going to be a good thing. And then he says, he says they, they went over a precipice thinking it was an apotheosis, thinking this is a moment of exaltation and not realizing they're going over a waterfall um, down into a cliff. So that, 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 those, those emotional things are one thing that he gives us. But, but I think the big thing that, that, that he gives readers is a sense of the war not being over when it's over. Um, and by that, I don't just mean, uh, you know, the, the, the wars of reconstruction, as they've been called. Um, I don't just mean the continuing conflict over um, the place of, of, of Black Americans. Uh, but the war, and, and Faulkner writes about that, he has his character Ringo say, um, say in, in The Unvanquished, this war ain't over, it just started good. He says that in, at the end of 1865. But, but I think what, what Faulkner gives us especially is a sense of the war enduring in people's consciences. Not consciences, consciousness. The war enduring, enduring in people's consciousness so that as, as he says in, in, in um, Intruder in the Dust, it's always there. It's always there in the back, in the, in the back of the mind of the white South. Uh, it keeps on replaying. It keeps on replaying with, with different outcomes sometimes in the, in the, the minds of the, the 12 or 14 year old white boys who are, who are thinking about the war and wondering about it. So, so he, what he gives us especially and I think Faulkner's style and his his way of bringing memory into the present, so that sometimes his characters seem to be living in a time that's not where they are physically, not when they are physically, but where where the the present drops away and suddenly they're back fifteen years before, and they 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 lose sense of of their physical time and space and and seem fully to be living in the past. I think I think that sense in, in his work that he does stylistically is conditioned by um, the his own consciousness that the war is not over, that there is that, that there, there's a place in the mind where it's all still happening uh, for people who grew up like him, for for, for people who grew up uh, white Southerners with great grandparents who fought in the war, with family members who were running the local sons of the confederacy um and so on um that that he gives us that sense of the ongoingness of it and then and then and then another one of the things else of things he does is he shows how how the world his characters live in um uh you know with all its poverty and um even its systems of land tenure have been shaped by the war so so the the, the social history we still determined by that. Yeah. Well, I, think I can add one, one, one thing in here. I was just been reading a quite wonderful book by the art historian Svetlana Alpers, which is a book about Walker Evans. Oh. And she says what, what Evans photographs in the 30s show is not so much the depression landscape as the landscape left by the war, huh. which there's never anything new and everything seems seems a little decrepit. Yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating book. Uh, Walk through Evans starting from scratch from Princeton. Yeah, yeah so it's particularly relevant. Yeah. I want to go back to your point that you always you you bring up several times 
um, in your work, and you've, you've brought it up once in our discussion about the famous Walt Whitman, you know, claim that the real war will never get into the books. And in a sense, that's somewhat true for Faulkner's literature because he so rarely brings us into the war itself. Um, and yet you also highlight the important ways in which perhaps the, the real war is something much more internal, um, internal within Faulkner himself, internal within his characters, internal within just the whole whole landscape of the county uh, that his his townspeople, as he calls them, inhabit. So I'm I'm kind of curious if you can uh, explain a little bit more uh, in that way about kind of the the real war uh, that Faulkner gets out, particularly with regards to um, the the war about about race and racial ideology in the world that he's living in uh, when he is his writing his his novels. Right. Okay. Um. Again, this is an easy question. <laughs> um, uh, the the war is not just the shooting. It's not just the shooting. It's not just those four years. It's everything that for Faulkner, I think, that flowed into those those four years of shooting and everything that flowed out of it. Um, the war as a as a interior or mental climate for him. It, it goes back to the 1830s to the settlement of of what he called Yoknipotoffa County, which is is his own home county of Lafayette County in, in northern Mississippi. It it is the slave society on which their economy was based, and then the consequences of the the end of that slave society which is then replaced by debt peonage and sharecropping and jim crow um and and that that there's a sort of it's almost a permanent crisis in the mind over 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 that 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 state of society that you, you never get over anything you know the famous line is the past is never past uh, past is never dead, it's not even past. Uh, nothing in Falker's world has ever gotten over, is ever put to rest. And that's true in the private lives of his characters. Um, they never get over the things they did to each other back when they were children or that their ancestors did to each other. But it's also it's also true to, to historically. So in, 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 in terms of race, um, I guess the best example I, I, I can think of here is, is what he does with Go Down Moses. Um, Go Down Moses is, is um, it's a novel in the form of stories, of a bunch of, a uh, number of different stories about the black and white descendants of one planter. Uh, you know, his, his white children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. And also his black ones, because because this is a man who raped his slaves uh, and had children by them, and then he raped the children. Of uh, he raped his own children and had more children. Um, and and what Falk does assist over generations with everybody on both sides knowing the truth. Everybody knowing the truth. The two sides of the family sort of linked and locked together in a kind of in a kind of of dance of the generations. Um, some of the black descendants knowing that that they have as much right to that land as the white descendants. The white descendants knowing that too. So there, 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 there's one man in, in the in the in the, the book, uh, one of the white descendants, a grandson of of the original planter. His name is Ike McCaslin. And I, reading the plantation ledgers uh, in the plantation store, this is 20 years after the war, um, it's the, the, the plantation has been turned into, share, into a sharecropper's place uh, run by a cousin. As he reads the, the plantation ledgers and starts to piece together the family history and realizes, realizes the, the crimes of his grandfather, the sexual crimes of his grandfather, and decides, he says, I can't have this name. I'm the legitimate heir to the sin. I can't have it. I want shut of this. This is a sin. This is a crime. I don't want any part of it. And and that's 
all, but that's also all he can do by way of expiation for those things. Is he can surrender his right to the land, but it's not going to go. It's not going to go to his black cousins. One of his white cousins is going to take it over uh, and run it for you know, and, and so will his children. It's it's an act of private expiation that doesn't go at any of the structural problems or or, or issues. Um, that the war has left in its place about the ownership of land. You know, I think when 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 I read when I read Faulkner, when I read that novel, when I read um, Absalom Absalom, which is his other great novel about slavery. Yes. Um, so Absalom Absalom and Go Down Moses are the novels that are most centrally about slavery, and then Light in August is not so much about slavery, but it is about race as a form of consciousness. Um, when, 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 when I read those novels, um, you read, you, I don't think you can read those novels now and not come away believing in the idea of reparations. I think, I, I really don't think you can. I think that's what those novels, he doesn't yet have the language for it, but I think that's what those novels are saying. That's what Ike is trying to do. Do you think that, do you think Faulkner was suggesting that as well? I, 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 th I, th I think he has a sense, he has a sense of a crime for which there can be no final expiation. And as you point out, though, in your book, that Faulkner personally, even in the 1950s, he prided himself on being a moderate. He had a few lapses here and there, but it, it's he was you know certainly had some reservations about the civil rights movement. It seems that reparations is it's interesting I, because the 50s he doesn't make any kind of suggestions. No, 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 and 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 nobody was really making suggestions. No, no one was like like, like that then. Right. But, but but rather when you read these novels now, uh, Ike certainly Ike certainly does think about what what recompense can I do? What in what way can this crime be ameliorated? And in some ways he says it can't be. Right. It can't be. But it doesn't mean you don't you don't try and do right. what you can right. privately. I think now you 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 read these books, right. and you will come away asking right. what people like. Faulkner's planters, what they owe to the people they enslaved. Right. And Michael, that, they just have that persists over generations. Michael, I want to ask Ashley something, yeah. then you can jump in here as well. Yeah. Ashley is very well read with Faulkner, much more than I am. It's nice that she gave me some credit. I've read a lot of Faulkner, but she's read it very seriously. Ashley also works with a lot of our first year students. We have a a really bright group yeah. we do every year but this year they seem to be very impressive so actually i'm curious assigning absalon absalon or something else first year students here at gettysburg are very bright they're go-getters i think they struggle struggle with faulkner actually put your ideas about what faulkner could do for our students and then michael i'd like for you to jump in as well because you know my point is is a lot of people aren't reading them anymore right and that i think is unfortunate so actually what's your take on on what Faulkner can do for our students. So I think, again, that the getting students past the initial linguistic hur hurdles of Faulkner would always be a challenge. Yeah. But I think that the, the divided consciousness that Faulkner approaches his writing with and that his works represent, they speak to um, a larger you know, ambivalence about Southern history, about Southern memory, um, that I think is important for young students and, and young scholars to become familiar with. Um, that, you know, Faulkner was definitely a man of his his times um, in the regards that he had certain, you know, racial beliefs that that we don't have today. But in other ways, he he thought and he wrote outside of his times with his fiction. Um, and yet his fiction is always, you know, burdened by, you know, the, the weight of the Southern past. So I think that if you pair that with, you know, what they read in, in traditional history or Civil War or Old South, you know, classes, that helps to give them a much fuller understanding of the contradictions and the divided mind and the way that, um, you know, Civil War memory has so many different different contours to it um, for for scholars of it, for for writers about it, for people who came from that world, a slaveholding world, um, or you know, descendants of that, um, yet who who struggle um, with the ambivalence of that. Um, so I guess I guess reading Faulkner is both historical source, um, but also making sense of of the literary 
um, you know, contributions that he made obviously uh, would, would be important for, for students to reckon with. Yeah, you know, and I, I'd give a couple of answers to that. I think if, if I'm teaching Faulkner in, a, in an English class, I would start with as I lay dying because you don't need to know other Faulkner to make sense of it. Uh, but if I'm teaching in a historical, in a historical framework, like as I have in, in my own course on the Civil War, I would use the unvanquished, um, which I've, I've been told that, that, that Leon Littmach used to teach in his, in his Civil War class at Berkeley as, uh, as the first book. <sighs> Leon Littmach wrote in Been in the Storm So Long. Um, that, and, and what I'd focus on in, in that book is, is you, you spoke, Ashley, about the, the ambivalence uh, with which we regard Faulkner, but uh, the main, the narrator of that book is, is grows up as the son of a Confederate colonel, Confederate colonel who then organizes the KKK in, in northern Mississippi, uh, regards his own family heritage with a great deal of ambivalence. Um, and, so, and so so that can be useful, but moreover, there's in one of the, and that's a, that's a novel made out of a set, set of collection, uh, stories that he wrote for magazines and then stitched together. There's one of those stories that, um, in which the narrator and his aunt and his best friend, who is also one of his family slaves, they go um, they go on a journey through the through the Mississippi and Alabama landscape, and as they go, they find a sort of long columns of, of contrabands of new freed people following in the wake of the Union Army, and they don't know what to make of this. At first, and then they gradually learn from what these people are doing and how, how they're, they're moving in the wake of the Union Army, um, going, as they say, for Jordan, for freedom. Um, and, and one of the things is that, that Faulkner's writing this in 1935, and this is not something that's on any mainstream historian's agenda in 1935 to study the contrabands. The person who's writing about it, of course, is W.E.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction in America. And, you know, and, and to, to think of the you know, Faulkner seeing the same thing as Du Bois is seeing. And in some ways coming to much the same judgment. Du Bois is the great fact of American history is the sudden freedom of four million people. And Faulkner, as his characters, followed follow these columns of people not really knowing what to make of them. They, they do have a sense that this is this is a huge historical tide that we are caught in and that we're gonna have we're, we're gonna have to deal with and, and that they're overwhelmed by them. it's the descriptions of those people marching across the landscape are just one of the most sublime things I think in all history. And I think yeah I think I'd add on to that too that Faulkner kind of he walks the balance between there's a there's a reverence and a certain romance and seduction about the southern past that um, you know people still have today to varying degrees and then there's also a, a repulsion about some of it and kind of a, a you know I'm, I'm sickened by these aspects especially of, of of certain racial components the most strict racial components um, that he's that he's referring to about lynching and, and all of that in his time and so I, I guess Faulkner opens up a world for us to kind of to understand both those sides with Faulkner's mm -hmm. personal deep connection to the Southern past ancestry with Confederate um, ancestors and kind of the deep sense of grief and loss and, and reverence for that heritage while at the same time being deeply, um, you know, alienated by some of mm -hmm. the lasting legacies that are so horrific um, of that system yeah. that his ancestors fought for. Um, so I think he, he opens up a way for us to really understand those two different kind of seemingly magnetically opposed forces and kind of get some conversation in the middle about that ambivalence um, that is helpful for us to understand. I, I think he's, he's saying, I hate this, but this is mine. This right. is me, this is where I'm from, this is who I am, this is what made me. Right. And I think there's no getting away from it. Right, right. Yeah. I think, um, Michael, we focus so much on the question of race and that's at the very heart of your book. And I, of course, am not suggesting that, that that's not important or that it shouldn't be at the heart of your book. But I am struck that 
by the fact that Faulkner is also speaking to this question of whiteness in a way that uh, this tendency to look at the historical past as something that can be explained for the by the quest for white supremacy, that there is that degree of unity amongst white people. I would say that Faulkner's work suggests something very, I think, quite different. Uh, and so I would like for you to speak to the fact that do we really find a, a uniform white experience in the South or he's got a, a, a eclectic class, a, a cast of characters here who are white and they often don't seem to be seeing eye to eye about things. No, 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 no. You think, think about, about the issue of white. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yes, whiteness in the sense that, you know, that, that Alexander Stevens said in, in his statement on the secession that no matter how little money you got, you, preserve, you know, the white people, they preserve the status of the white man. Stephen says that, Debo says that. But Faulkner's white world is deeply split and deeply riven. Um, there are, there are the, there's the world of the landowners, the plantation owners, um, who, some of whom managed to preserve their money and their land in the generation after the war it switches over to sharecropping but their their power and position is still is still um, dominant for much of of the cycle of yoke Patapa. there are the people who live in town who may not have much connection to the land and then and this is in, increasingly important in his work as he as he goes on on um, the world of, of the rural poor um, who don't see that they have much in common at all with with um, with the world of the landowners. I mean, the the the, the, the shorthand in in Faulkner's studies is there's the, the landowners have the, the name is Sartorus, uh, the boy I described who who goes uh, across that journey is, is Bayard Sartorus, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the poor whites are known as the Snopeses. Snopes, yeah. um, Although the the, the, the Snopeses are, are poor whites who are conniving go-getters who are going to win and play dirty and and in a way I think Faulkner loves them because they have so many tricks up their sleeve. <laughs> but, but but he often Faulkner liked tricks. He liked shenanigans um, as fictional subjects. But there are also a many other poor whites, um, the Bundren family, and as I lay dying, he's he's fascinated by that world of that sort of rural, um, impoverished, often illiterate world, a world of, of, of oral culture, people swapping stories. And, and no, they, they, they all vote for the Democrats, for, the, for, for you know, what we would call the Dixiecrats um, when they vote. But, yeah, but, but we should know if they haven't been disfranchised. If they haven't been disenfranchised. If they, they got to pay the poll tax, they have to do the literacy tax. Exactly, well, yeah, yeah. But, but, um, but, you know, they don't have much in common. And, and of course, in, in writing about that and showing those internal divisions, Faulkner is also getting at, <coughs> excuse me, what, was actually going on in white Mississippi politics in his lifetime with the shift from what were called the Bourbons, um, you know, the, the upper class uh, who held on to a lot of political power in the state uh, into the early 20th century. And, and then the, the rise of people like Vardaman and Bilbo. You see this in, in um, William Alexander Percy's Lanterns on the Levee, which is a, a memoir of, of the teens and twenties in Mississippi. Um, so, so no, no, that that white world is is deeply split, and quarrelsome, um, and and violent often. Um, it has, I think, you know, important lessons for us today because we have a a, a media that is relentless and creating a binary between white and black, and both sides are uniformed in their political positions and 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 their actions, and it's. It's a reductionism that is extremely troubling to me. And all we have to do, I think, is to look at Faulkner and we see that behind the banner of white supremacy, as you've just pointed out, is a white society that's badly fractured and uh, often at, at, at odds with, the, at, with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and, at odds with each other. And, and, then, and then in some ways, in some ways, the white supremacy becomes a tool that different factions 
in that white world use in order to paper over yeah, the cracks um, the, 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 the between them that that um you know it it, 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 it they, they it's used to enforce a false unanimity yeah. in some ways in, in in the in the gym in the white world that he's writing about um the phrase i like to use here is is one that Faulkner's friend the university of mississippi historian jim silver came up with it's called the closed society um so mississippi is not a place in which there was really much air it was closed air, all the terms were fixed very hard to break to, to break out um, yeah. i'm curious another another facet of course of of southern history doesn't just you know turn on the the idea of race and racial ideology but also on southern conceptions of of gender norms masculinity and and femininity um and faulkner kind of plays around with those as well in some of his novels you you see the men who are supposed to be the patriarchs and taking charge of the household um like the bundren family for instance almost being emasculated or um you know effeminate at times and then you see the the female figures taking charge and becoming more powerful and kind of the, the dominant voice of the family, which again is surprising, um, both you think for the time in which he's writing and the time that he's writing about. Can you kind of explain a little bit about that, his his take on gender and what that reveals about the 19th century and early 20th century uh, South? Right. Yeah, you know, I was, I was rereading um, The Sound of the Fury recently and um, and one of the things that struck me, I mean, different things strike me each time I reread that book. But one of the things that really struck me this time was, was the portrayal of, of the Compson mother, Mrs. Compson, Carolyn, um, uh, who always presents herself as weak, as an invalid, as helpless. She's been left helpless by her husband who drank himself to death and her older son is a suicide and her daughter has run off and been promiscuous. So she presents herself as a victim. Uh, but she controls that family. She controls that family through her illness, um, through the, the, her constant protestations of, of her own helplessness. She, she controls, she determines the, I mean, the, the one, um, she has the, the the son who's mentally disabled, but also the the other son who is described as sane, but who in many ways is emasculated. Mm -hmm. who, who, um, Jason, uh, so wonderfully vicious, um, but but who who is in some ways emotionally crippled by this mother who sort of squats over his life, pretending, claiming that she has no power at all. Now, in another hand, in another way, I think um, I think Faulkner's really good on old ladies. Uh, he's really good on old ladies. Uh, he he's he's better on in some ways he's better on old ladies than he is on on you know sort of because uh, women his own age, um, you know that 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 the, the the female protagonists who are you know uh, I'll say who have a sexual presence are often um, depicted as as a little shrewish, um, a little um, grasping, but the old ladies, you know, he's got yes, he's got Mrs. Thompson, but he's also got a number of sort of fierce, almost indomitable, powerful, worldly competent old ladies who who run this world in the absence of men. You know, and 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 uh, sometimes uh, uh, you, uh, you see this in some of the, the the novels set around the Civil War. The men are away, and the women, <coughs> excuse me, are, are left to run things. I've been talking too much today. Um, the women are left to run things, and it makes me think of, of Drew Faust's book *Mothers of Invention* on um, women in, in the, the home front during, during the Confederacy. Um, these are inventive, resourceful women uh, and powerful figures. Um, there are lots of things one, one can say about about Faulkner. I mean, I mean the, the, the other thing, and to go back to to go back to the sound and fury. Um, the character who he said was his, you know, his sort of the jewel of his heart, his caddy, 
Patty Thompson, who never actually appears in the novel. She's only there in the memories of her brothers. She's the one who's had an affair and gotten pregnant and left and gone away and never shows herself again, except in memory, her brother's memories of what she was like, the time she did reappear. And, and, and yet she is, you know, she sort of, she's not given a voice in that she determines everything about those brothers' lives, simply through her, her presence and, and her magnetism. Um, she's, she's very compelling. And then in, in light in August, the, the character, um, um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the names. I'm blanking on, I'm, I'm getting old. The, the, uh, the, 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 the young woman we meet at the, at the start of the novel, um, who's pregnant, who's basically barefoot and pregnant. And he assumes that everything is going to be just fine, and it is. Uh, and Faulkner presents her as a, as a kind of earth mother figure. And, and honestly, it, it drives my students crazy. Uh, it drives my students cra 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 crazy, that, that characterization. Um, but but Faulkner's clearly entranced by it. Um, so I can't believe I forgot that name. <laughs> and, and, you know, and Fa Fa Faulkner has scenes, of course, where characters of his can't remember the names of the people they've been talking to. And he makes it into a little drama. Uh, he does that in his, in, in his I Lay Dying, but but here I am, I'm, I'm caught by that myself. Uh, <laughs> sure. Somebody's going to get to send it in, yeah. yeah. Do you get the sense that his his approach, especially toward the portrayal of, of men as being somehow not able to provide for their families and women as having to step up and, you know, take over these kind of unseemly roles, do you get the sense that that is a kind of a critique at Kind of the backlash of the war, what the war revealed about yeah. the the inner feebleness of the Southern family, which of course Confederates you know pride themselves and Southerners you know prided themselves on the fact that you know that the patriarch would defend the home and hearth, they defend you know the women at home, and then the reality of it is that so many of those women are left to fight for themselves and. In no way am I saying that when the men came home, Southern women said, you know, I, I just want to be freed. I want to be liberated. You know, I'm, I'm done, you know, with you. Um, a lot of them do go back to wanting that patriarchal figure. But there are definitely some who realize the system didn't exactly play out as how it was supposed yeah. to. Yeah. Um, and I realize, you know, I have to be a little bit more independent or at least a little bit more wary of, of relying on this patriarchal system and, you know, traditional gender norms. Do you get the sense that Faulkner is making a connection there between the war and its impact on masculinity and femininity, or do you think that he's trying to peel back layers of, of something that was always there, you know, before before the war came? That maybe the facade of, of Southern chivalry and uh, the romantic patriarchal structure wasn't really as um, as solid as we might think it to be from the outside. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I have a couple answers to that, and one is, one is the way you're describing it reminds me of of World War II. And of all the women who worked in the industry in World War II, going back into the home, we get this period of pronounced domesticity. And then, boom, 15 years later, we've got the start of the feminist movement, uh, you know, with, with Betty Friedan and so on and so on. Um, so in, in reaction to that, that sense post-World War II of enforced domesticity, of a resumption of traditional roles. Um, uh, and so I think, I think, again, one moment is echoing off another. But the, the way you describe it, I think, maybe gives too much intentionality to Faulkner. Mm -hmm. um, that that I, I think I think he's noting that phenomena. But whether he means to say anything by it, as opposed to just providing a, a kind of portrait of, of his moment, um, is another question. You know, and, and, I, and I, as I say that, I know that in, in literary critical terms, what I've just said is extraordinarily naive. Uh, that that he's he's just registering what's going on, um, but but I you know I I don't think he's that systematic a thinker about gender. Um, I'm not certain he's much of a systematic thinker about anything except uh, at his at best uh, at at his best on race, um, but but um, and then only in his fiction, not not in his personal life or not in his public statements. But I don't, I don't think about gender. He's a systematic thinker. I do think that what what you're what you're sh describing is there, 
go, that, that he's got a world in which there's an awful lot of ineffectual men. Um, you know, and, and we can we can speculate at various reasons about that. Um, you know, uh, doubtless there are things in his own family history or the world he saw around him that would contribute to that. Uh, but I'm, I'm not certain there's much intentionality uh, there, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Right. So let's go back to um, this issue of race. Yeah. And you had a very long review of your book in The Atlantic by yeah. Drew Gilpin Faust, our audience, of course, knows her work, her Civil War scholarship, and she took a, a little sabbatical from that to be president right. of Harvard, and now she's back yeah. at yeah. Harvard. And I felt like, you know, it was uh, a very positive review. And uh, again, you get uh, that kind of attention uh, for one's book in the Atlantic. You've got to feel good about that. Okay. She's raising the question, though, I think about whether Faulkner is still um, appropriate for us to read, uh, necessary for us to read, especially when it comes to the question of race. So can you just speak to that? If Drew Gilpin Faust is here, what would you say to her about the review? Okay. Um, yes, necessary, because, well, as Faulkner himself said that, that what he wants to show is is you know the human heart in conflict with itself that's that that that's his great subject um that what what but his work also in a way in conflict with itself that that you know we we've been describing <clears throat> different sides of him and as being you know in a way at war and tension with each other there is a sort of drama <clears throat> involved for us I think in in reading Faulkner, in watching Faulkner, <clears throat> in watching in watching a white American of his time and place try to sort out those conflicts, uh, and sometimes succeeding and other times failing. Um, one of the other reviews um, uh, of the book was by Ayanna Mathis, an African American novelist, who in is in the New York Times book review. And she said that one of the things Faulkner really does is provide a kind of anatomy and critique of of, of whiteness. But I think it's, yeah, I think that's right. Um, I didn't put it so nicely as she did. Uh, but but I think I think that one of the things he does, he gives us a sense of yeah, reading him, reading him provides you with a sense of the drama and conflict that questions of race. And of historical memory, I've always posed for white Americans, and, and that, that he makes us conscious of that in a way that I think no other white writer of his moment did. Now, is he the only person we should read? Obviously not. We have to read other things too. Um, and what I what I've just said about about the Faulkner as historical witness, Faulkner as you know as a I guess a participant in the dialogue of our American history that's quite separate from what Faulkner, the formal innovator, the novelist, the the um, you know the the, you know, the the aesthetic Faulkners. Although increasingly, I find myself unable to separate those those things. I think I think for me that that Faulkner as American voice in terms I've described goes goes hand in hand and, and is inseparable from Faulkner, the experimenter, the, the formal innovator. I think that the things he realizes about American history are inseparable from and dependent on his ability to bring the past into the present in, in, in formal terms. Uh, he's not the only voice we need, uh, but he's been a powerful and determinative voice. I mean that that you know, read Faulkner and then read um, Richard Wright's Uncle Tom's Children, uh, which is coming out of it's a different side of that Mississippi world that Faulkner grew up in, uh, as Wright grew up in. Um, read Faulkner and then read and then read Jasmine Ward, um, whose some of whose characters are acutely conscious of Faulkner as something they study in school. 
and are intrigued by while also feeling its distance from their lives. Uh, Faulkner is is a powerful presence in Natasha Trefla. Uh She's fighting with him, but the fight is against something that's made her into the wonderful poet she is. Um, so, so we're, we're not going to read just Faulkner to know what the South was, but he's going to, we still have to read him. I know one of the things that Pete and I were talking about yesterday was your, your kind of methodology for putting this book together. You have some very interesting sources that you've been calling through, ranging from comparative literature to, of course, the, the literature of Faulkner himself to historical document, um, uh, documents to um, textbooks, uh, which I thought were, were one of the more intriguing sources, but also this travel log that you kind of walk us through as you're visiting these different places that were important to Faulkner and his world and, and thus the world of his characters, uh, whether it's Oxford or whether it's Ripley um, or you know other Civil War battlefields, Vicksburg or, or Shiloh. Um, and so I, I'm wondering, of all of those sources, whether they are sources that are more traditional, written down on paper, sources such as part of the historical landscape, is there one that spoke particularly to you that really helped to, to shape or inform uh, more of this book than than others? Yeah. Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> but you know, when when you talked about the, uh, I'll answer that in two ways. One is one is about the. The methodology, which is is heterogeneous, it's it's um, a little confused. And, and some years ago, I wrote a travel book about um, about uh, spending a year in Germany, uh, which has its own questions of historical witness, of course. Um, but I found that that when you when you're writing tra about travel experiences, sort of anything you think as you walk along a city street becomes fair game. And I, I and I've learned from that. I try to write my critical books now as if I'm telling a story. And that involves some plot summary. It involves um, looking at the, the things that went into the writing of, of a particular writer's book and involves more biography than I, than I was was used to. Um, uh, but some particular, and, and so so there's this, yeah, this mix of things, on the ground experience, which sometimes I use to get a chapter going as kind of journalistic hook almost but also also as as uh you know to make the reader see where things happen make, make the reader see um particular sources i was i was thinking about this and there are a couple of sources i found late in my work that um really shaped uh a couple of the chapters um uh the the, the, the chapters on reconstruction in particular. Um, and one was a, a book that came out in 1906 uh, by a man named John Eaton, who during the war had been, um, he'd been the superintendent of the Toledo schools as a young man, and then he became a, a Civil War chaplain. And then at some point, in, I think in 1863, he was told basically, um, all these freed people are following the army following the Union Army, as whereas Grant's army is going through Mississippi, uh, figure out what to do with them. Uh, figure out what, what to do with them, because one is they're slowing, they, they, ob they have to be fed, they have to be taken care of, they have to be, you know, they're, they're, that they're starving, they're ill, but they're also impeding the movement of the army. And so, so, so Grant basically said to, to Eaton, who was a chaplain, uh, do something about this. And, and one of the things that, that Eaton did is he basically invented the refugee camp um, and set up camps for contrabands in the wake of the Union Army uh, and seems to have done it extremely well. And so 40 years later, and he had a, he had a distinguished career in the civil service after the war. He became, we didn't have the Department of Education then, but he became what we would now call the head of the Department of Education. Uh, he wrote a book called Grant, Lincoln, and the Freedmen um, that really is sort of testimony about, about um, uh, that period in 1863 to 1865, uh, the Union Army trying to, to figure out what to do with 
with, um, you know, and armies were made to fight. They, they weren't made for social relief, but they had to do it. And you started to figure it out. And Chandra Manning has used that book as a wonderful source in, in, in her recent Trouble Refuge. The other book I found I found is 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 um, uh, a slave narrative uh, that is is um, called Thirty Years a Slave by Lewis Hughes, um, which and Hughes writes about the same physical territory basically that Faulkner's writing about. It's one county over, uh, but but what what Hughes shows is the way in which slavery wasn't over when it was over. You know that, that the emancipation the war is over not just the emancipation proclamation the war is over but still his his one-time owner is trying to keep trying to keep him on the plantation and, and he keeps on the war is over he keeps on trying to escape and bring his wife into freedom and the owner keeps on pulling him back and threatening to shoot him and finally he finally he, he gets a couple of union soldiers to help him um and and they they think this is just a great thing to do um and they, they help him and his wife and some, some other people on that plantation uh, get away um and so so those two sources um in the period were re really really powerful for me. well we we cannot let you leave without recounting for us um, your thoughts and feelings when you were standing before the virginia monument here at gettysburg with of course the RE the equestrian yeah. uh, dairy top. And I believe it's uh it's intruder in the dust, right? Mm -hmm. So could you for our audience talk to us what is probably Faulkner's most direct reference to the war years? Could you could you just quote that for us if you don't mind? You don't have to do the entire thing, but give us a sense of that. And then could you tell us your per very personal feelings uh, from being there? Can I'm gonna get an actual sentence. Do it, please do. I have, I have the, the uh, just so that I don't get Faulkner's language wrong. Uh, okay. For every Southern boy, 14 years old, not once, but whenever he wants it, there is the instant when it's still not yet two o'clock in that July afternoon in 1863. The brigades are in position behind the rail fence. The guns are laid and ready in the woods and the furled flags are already loosened to break out. And Pickett himself with his long oil ringlets and his hat in one hand probably, and his sword in the other looking up the hill waiting for Longstreet to give the word. And it's all in the balance. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't even begun yet. It not only hasn't begun yet, but there is still time for it not to begin. And then it goes on for another page. <laughs> Uh, and with sort of unbroken sentence, and and uh, um, one of the things that that um, you know, it's it's a moment of fantasy. Uh, it's a moment that tells us why the Civil War has stayed so much a part of the consciousness of the South. I say that, and you'll you'll hear my Yankee voice uh, saying that. But um, uh, that sense of what if of alternate histories playing out. What what I thought when I was when I did that walk, uh, and you told me where to start and how to come back. He, um, what I thought is is the importance, um, not just for historians but also for literary scholars, of walking over the ground, of going to the places that the writers you're interested in have been and written about and it's 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 not to you know find you, you, it's not to find some you know echo or some remnant or some spirit of the places the victorians thought it's not to look for for models um precisely but it does help you visualize uh it does help you visualize the past um, to see the actual ground, to know, you know, in 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 that book, the the to, to know what they're thinking of. Uh, so to see the ground, uh, I found that it's true true at Gettysburg. I found it especially true at Shiloh. Um, I think I think a lot of uh, when you read military history, especially, I think battles 
are often illegible uh, as you read the books, unless you can unless you pay really close attention to the maps. But it becomes much more legible if you've walked the ground. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's what you know. I, I look forward to visiting, coming back to Gettysburg and visiting more battlefields too. Yeah. Myself. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah. we are eager to get you back here in June, second weekend of June. I always get the dates wrong, and Ashley has to. What day is it? Second weekend is a Saturday, and I don't know off the top of my head. Yes. Well, we begin on a, a Thursday, uh, June eleventh through the thirteenth uh, of twenty twenty one for our our conference. But your sat your um, lecture is scheduled for Saturday. It might be actually yours is the the thirteenth. I can't remember off the top well, of my head. I want to get there on a Thursday anyway. Oh, good. I want to hear. I want to hear the other speakers. Yeah. Yes. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael. It's been it's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, and again, to have someone from from outside our traditional field of of history and, and public history to bring in some different angles for us uh, and for our audiences and hopefully provide a, a teaser for some people um, who might be coming to the conference next June to, to hear your lecture um, as well. That will be great. Um, and just as a quick note for next week, uh, Pete and I will be doing something a little bit different. Uh, we're gonna be on the battlefield out at Oak Ridge uh, talking about Alfred Iverson's assault on July 1st. Um, we're gonna pre-record uh, a, a short battlefield segment and then he and I will hope to be available if we can get the technology uh, working as we plan to, uh, to answer questions afterwards. So something a little bit different for our audience members, but hopefully you will all tune in next week at 1230 for a battlefield experience. And, uh, I think we should, for, before the conference, we should maybe pick a Faulkner book and not assign it to the attendees. We, we, we want people to come to our conference. We don't want to give them homework. But for those who uh, may want to uh, either reacquaint themselves with Faulkner or try it out for the first time, Michael will probably be in touch and will think of, of a book. I think that would be a wonderful way. You got to be great, or, or even just a couple of short stories. You know what? That's even a better idea. I like that. <laughs> no cliff notes, though, right? No, 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 no. No, no cliff notes. All right. Let's okay. just have some great stories. Michael, hey, congratulations on a wonderful book. Thank you for having me. It's been a, a lot of fun to be here. Yeah, Thank right. you. Thanks. <laughs> Take care, Michael. Thank you. Great seeing you, man. Great. Yeah. And, and what a wonderful book. You write beautifully. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to read the James book at some point, but uh, yeah, really, you not only do you write beautifully, but I was immediately drawn in because the Luxembourg Gardens is my favorite place in Paris.